Hello. <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah, so nice to finally e meet you. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I wanted to hear your uh, thoughts on uh, the freedom of art. How the situation was like right after the revolution so in Iran? So when the uh, revolutionary order uh, was set in Iran after 1979, one of the first things that happened was the banning of music. Um, and, and so suddenly uh, you had uh, n no music on radio, no, nothing on television, no concerts, nothing at all. And that life without music was very difficult, that it was very oppressive to have, to have no sound, you know. So you would turn on radio, it was talk, 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 talk. There was zero music, not even um, propaganda music on radio. And I think then as a result, they started to miss it too, because, you know, it's very hard to have a news program if you don't have some kind of a music that starts the news program, or it's very hard to uh, be in a war and want to recruit soldiers if you don't have any sort of recruitment music, right? So I think very quickly they realized that for their own purposes, they need some kind of propaganda music that they need to allow. So they went from no music to, okay, maybe some music, but music definitely with no women uh, as singers and, and with um, very, very strict thematic uh, landscape. So it couldn't be, say, pop music, but it could be men singing religious music um, on television and all that. And once they began to allow that little bit, then people looked for spaces um, in which they could um, begin to exercise. There was a great proliferation of um, music instructional schools after the revolution in Iran, which is very odd that you have a system, you have a government that's banning music, but then suddenly, as soon as they allow a little bit of music, there are all sorts of um, institutes and music schools that pop up everywhere. So why is that? I mean, the, the most natural one is that um, you know, the people are against or want to voice their opposition to the ruling by the regime, and therefore they go precisely to do what the regime doesn't want them to do. That, that's one explanation, but which is true. It, it's not untrue. However, there is more to it, which is that um, I believe that the, the art that brought people into the streets in 1979. The, the main vehicle, artistic vehicle of the Iranian revolution was poetry. Right? So you had, you had a slew of poets, you had a slew of uh, writing and literary expressions um, that were anti-governmental, that were inflammatory, that, that um, encouraged people to come to the streets to rebel against the former uh, monarchy. And once people came, because all these literary figures had invited them to come, and once this new order took place, and they saw, people saw that it wasn't what they had hoped to see, they also turned against literature and poetry because it was as if literature and poetry had played a part in getting people to believe in something that had betrayed them. So I believe that after the revolution, people begin to turn away from literature, from poetry especially, and they begin to explore and look at other art forms, film and music, 
and, and painting being the three most important ones. So uh, in your mind, is there any justification for this kind of uh, censorship or ban of art in any society? No, I, I think, um, you know, it, art is, is a necessity, is a human necessity. Um, as I described it, you know, the absence of music felt like the absence of air, the absence of, you know, life. It was, it, you know, it, it just not having any sounds in, in our daily life, you know, it, um, was, um, had a major effect uh, on all of us. And, you know, we, we think of, we think of Iran as, as um, a republic with a government and, and a legitimate, with legitimate elections and all that. But in fact, um, I think Iran in many ways, um, post-revolutionary Iranian government has been the inspiration for a lot of these um, extremist groups, including ISIS. So um, one of the first major policies that went into effect um, initially after the revolution was the banning of music um, in Iran. And, and it was, um, in retrospect, a very, very ISIS-like step. Um, you didn't have that, uh, the usual soundtrack that goes into the routine of daily life. Um, so everything became very gloomy, very quickly. And, and um, it is not surprising, I think, in retrospect, to think why, uh, you know, the use of antidepressants has become so popular in Iran over the past 40 years. So much so that, you know, there, there are um, reports that, you know, just like you carry gum, you know, a pack of gum in your handbag or a pack of um, mints in your handbag, people have antidepressants in their handbag and oftentimes they offer it to other people. Would you like a Prozac? Would you like this? Would you like that? And that, you know, there are many reasons for why that could be the case, but certainly the fact that um, so much of um, that people's expressions have been censored, including access to music and art, um, has had a very, very a tragic effect on the whole population and which is why I think in part they're depressed or, okay. or the rate of depression has gone uh, has gone up in Iran. Yeah, I guess uh, a lot of artists were in uh, quite big troubles at the time then. So um, I remember one instance um, when um, one of the great uh, classical music artists of Iran. There was a um, fellow called Lotfi, um, who um, had actually been very invested in the revolution himself. He had been, you know, he had been actively participating in in the overthrow of the monarchy. So, you know, to think that you are, you know, for all of this transformation and then to find yourself disillusioned by it was, was very, very tragic. So I remember this guy about two, three years after the revolution had no venues where he could sing, none whatsoever. And it, it must be devastating if you're a singer or a performer that, um, you suddenly find yourself without any places where you can go to express yourself. So, uh, so they made, they had made an exception that if you were a singer uh, or a performer, uh, you could perform and sing for non-Iranian, non-Shiite audiences. So you could perform at foreign embassies 
if they invited you. Um, you could perform, say, at the German embassy in Tehran. You could perform at, uh, you know, the Canadian embassy in Tehran. And you could perform if the special organizations of Iran's, uh, li you know, sanctioned religious minorities invited you. So uh, the Iranian Jewish Students Organization invited Lotfi. And this grand guy, this music icon, walks into this two bedroom or three bedroom, you know, office space that's run by the Iranian Jewish, um, you know, student association. And in a big, big living room that they had, this this legendary singer sits across from like 25 people and starts to sing you know and i was there and i was stunned because you know if they told me when i was 13 and 14 that i could be in the same room with this man i would have never believed it but here i was you know he was singing i was here he was done we all sat together with him and we had tea so which was unfathomable but yes i saw him and he performed um and it was only because this was a jewish student association um where he was allowed to sing and he he uh, um, i mean we loved it but he was clearly uh horror stricken because it you know it, 25 people in such a small space wasn't what he had hoped um w where he had hoped to be Thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. Of course. To talk with you. It was very, okay. very interesting, very enlightening for me. Uh -huh. All right. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.